is a volumetric algebra associated to finite graphs. So it's the topology of point-wise convergence on vectors. 
Now, the fact that these conditions are equivalent is one on its double commutant theorem. And it's, it is so interesting mainly because one side is a purely algebraic condition. So, n is equal to m double commutant is purely algebraic. And the other side is some analytic or topological condition. And since these two are equivalent, the whole subject is permeated with a kind of tension between the algebraic and analytic approaches. So many proofs we can give from either the algebraic viewpoint or from the analytic viewpoint and they yield and they give different things which are interesting in their own right. So we will see, we will see how, how, it, how this thing occurs even in the topic of physics. Okay. So that's the one number. Then we have a factor. So a factor is a kind of simple one number. The only things that come up with everything in M are multiple scalar multiples of the identity. Now factors there's a well known, well developed classification theory of factors due to Murray and von Arnen. And among the various kinds of factors, one of them was particularly interested in a kind called 2 1 factors. So, a 2 1 factor is a special kind of factor. And that comes with a The most important fact is it comes with a trace. It's equipped with a natural trace tau, and this trace is unique. And the fact that it's faithful says that tau of x star x is 0 implies x is 0, and that it's normal is some continuity for the sigma weak topology. But never mind all that, just if you just concentrate on the algebraic part, it's a trace. The 2 1 factor comes with a unique uh, trace tau, which is normalized to be 1 at all. Okay. So, examples of 2 1 factors abound. So, the first simplest kind are, so start with like G here, countable. Then G has uh, its left regular representation acting on the Hilbert space L2G. So, I the left regular representation of G. On L2G. And you take the image and take its double complement. So, we find L of G. The image of G plus lambda, that's just a representation lambda of G on F of G, and take lambda G double commutant. So this is a one and an algebra. To begin with, if you just take an arbitrary discrete, uh, arbitrary discrete of the group, this is just a one and an algebra. And when will it be a factor? This will be a factor if G satisfies the condition called ICC. This is a factor. conjugacy classes, except for of course the trivial one, all of them are infinite. All conjugacy classes are infinite, infinite conjugacy class condition. So this is a factor and is a two one factor and further. So as you can see in geometry group theory of course these are objects of interest countable groups. You want to study countable groups. And from each one of these, you will get a 2-1 factor. And the variety of 2-1 factors that you get 
there's a large, it's not, it's not, it's not the different groups will give you different two one factors, but there is a large number of different kinds of two one factors that you can get from countable groups. So one of the outstanding open problems in this subject is the following. So for example, so let's let me just take two examples of countable groups which satisfy ICC. So G equals S infinity. The infinite symmetric group, that's the union of all the symmetric groups, that one, or G equals three groups. Three group on N generators. Both of these satisfy ICC and therefore they give you these two one factors. And it's been open for a long time now. If you take a free group on two generators, and if you take a free group on three generators, and you consider their the associated two one factors, are these isomorphic or not? So, whether in fact LF2 is isomorphic to LF3 has been open for many years. Lot, a lot of uh, mathematics has developed just around trying to solve this problem. The whole field of free probability theory arose as an attempt to solve this problem. And as we will see that. Some of, some of the techniques of free probability, which we will also use in, in our main <coughs> Okay, so this is the open problem in this subject. It is known, of course, that these two are different. So, LF2 is definitely not isomorphic to MS infinity. One of them gives you the hyperfinite factor, and the other gives you the non hyperfinite factor. This is a property of two one factors which distinguishes LF2 from. LS infinity. And it is also known that all amenable, all countable amenable groups give you the same factor. So it's not that two different groups will give you two different factors. It's, it's known that all amenable groups will essentially give you the same thing as LS infinity. This is often this is a very special two one factor, usually denoted by R. That is the notation that one R will use for it, and it's still used. Okay. Fine. So that is that's that much for factors. So now let next let go to subfactors. So a subfactor is a unit of inclusion of two one factors. From henceforth I'll only concentrate on two one factors. I'm not going to concentrate on factors of any other kind. So when I talk about factors, it's only two one factors. So subfactor. is a unical inclusion. NLM of two one factors. And if you further restrict to the case that both the two one factors are hyperfinite, this is not a restriction I make always, but let's just consider the case that both these two one factors are in fact isomorphic to R. Then all the information is in how one factor is placed inside another. If it's not Individually, the nature of the factors themselves, both of them are R, so the simplest kind of two one factor. So, how is one placed inside another? That is the question that we want to answer here. Hmm. So, this is some kind of. Unit means one goes to one. Unit means one goes to one. It could also sometimes, you could consider inclusions where one goes to a projection, but we are not going to be interested in that. Unit inclusion, one goes to one. So, can you have R going to R being unital and not being an Yes. You could have R going to R being unital and not R. That's the whole. That, that's the point. Yeah. There is a measure of. So, so we want we want to see. We want to uh, classify. So, big problem is classify some factors. Even in case when both N and M are R. Now, this problem is too hard. This problem is too hard. For example, this includes the problem of classification of all finite groups. For instance, right? Not just simple, all finite groups. Right? So this problem is quite hard. I mean, one doesn't expect any kind of reasonable answer to it unless you put restrictions on what kind of factors or subfactors you are going to consider. Okay, so that's the big problem. So as a first step to classifying subfactors, one will look, of course, for numerical invariants. So are there numerical invariants that you can associate to n and m, which will distinguish at least some tests? And Jones came up with such a thing. 
So, associate it to M and M. is its index, which we denoted by, just like in groups, which is a real number. A real number from one to infinity. And this index can distinguish some pairs of subtractors. And the most wonderful thing that he showed about the index Part of the reason why he got the Fields method for this thing is he showed that this index is quantized. You cannot take all possible values from 1 to infinity. It can take any possible value from 4 to infinity, and between 1 and 4, it can take only a discrete set of values 4 cos squared pi by n. So, index is quantized. So, um, it must be greater than or equal to 4 or 4 cos squared pi by n. So within 1 to 4, it can take a discrete set of values. Beyond 4, it can take every possible value. No, so this is, this, is one, this is one basic invariant that you can associate to a subfactor which will distinguish something. But this is just the simplest one. There is a lot more that you can do. And in trying to find out what more you can do, Jones introduced this thing called the basic construction. So I should mention, I should mention here that what what is this index? So what is this index? So this index arises from the k theory of a factor. So it can be shown that modules over a factor are just classified by a single real number. So there is this phenomenon of continuous dimension. You could have a module which is not just m, m direct sum, m, m direct sum, m direct sum, m. So there's modules of rank 1, rank 2, rank 3, but you could also have modules of rank 1.3 or modules of irrational rank. You could have modules of all possible ranks. And this index is the rank of this module m, essentially, as a module over m. So if you consider m as a left module over n, its rank is what is what is the what he called the index of the subfactor. Okay. So then he came up with this construction called the basic construction, which does the following. So from one subfactor n in m of finite index. subfactor n and m and do something and produce a new subfactor which is larger than m. So this is m contained in m1 and this also is a pair of 2 1 factors also a finite index equal to the index of the original one. And of course when you have such a construction it asks for it to be repeated. So you begin with n and m then you produce m1 and you take m and m1 apply the same construction get m2 then you take m1 and m2. Since all of these have the same index and are all 2 1 factors, you can just repeat this construction to get a whole tower. So this tower is called the basic construction tower. And this basic construction tower leads to what's known as the standard invariant for the subfactor. The standard invariant for the subfactor essentially contains all the algebraic information that is there in the subfactor. There is still a lot of analytic information that is left out by the standard invariant, but I am not going to be interested in analytic information. I am only going to be interested in what kind of discrete invariants, algebraic invariants can you get from a subfactor. And everything that you can get in some form or the other is contained in the standard invariant. So what is the standard invariant? You take this basic construction tau. So you begin with the subfactor n in m, perform the basic construction and you get this basic construction tau. 
then what you do is, so all of these are one Raman algebras, right? Infinite dimensional one Raman algebra. They are all two one factors. Then what you do is you look at the relative commutant. You look at the commutant of one inside the other. For example, you could look at n commutant in M. The elements in M which commute with everything in N. Or you could look at n commutant in M1. Elements in M1 that commute with everything in N. You get a whole chain of algebras. We need not do this just for N. We could also look at M commutant. So we could look at M commutant in M1 or m commutant in m2. Again, you get a sequence. And of course, if something in m1 commutes with m, then it will certainly commute with n. Right? So this one is going to be smaller. right? And I can also put in n commutant intersect n here. But n is a factor. Everything that commutes with everything in n is just the scalars. That's what it means for n to be a factor. So this is just complex numbers. And similarly, m commutant intersect m. This also is just complex numbers. So you get such a um, sec, so, such a uh, sequence, two sequences of uh, finite uh, finite dimensional algebras. The important thing is these are. Finite number, one, essentially. <coughs> the one fact that is needed to see this is that if n and m is a finite index, then n commutant intersect m is finite dimensional. So now, from from this huge infinite dimensional thing, these both are very large infinite dimensional thing. You have got a grid of finite dimensional algebras. Now one would expect that finite dimensional algebras are easier to understand, easier to manipulate, everything more understandable than infinite dimensional ones. So you got some information from this. So, so is this index not just a dimension? No, in in the dimension index, of what? You no, know, in this finite dimensional case, yeah. what is the index? Is it just the... No, the, the index is only defined for two one factors because oh. only for them the modules have this continuous dimension. Right. For finite dimensional ones, they don't have this property. Okay. So there is no index defined for these, but these are just finite dimensional C star algebras, essentially multi matrix algebras. And you have containments of multi matrix algebras arranged in a grid as follows. These are all finite dimensional, and this is called the standard invariant of this uh, sub factor. Now, one can try to go the other way. If you want to construct subfactors, one could try and begin with a grid like this. You take a grid of finite dimensional algebras like this. You take a, some finite dimensional algebras increasing and another one and appropriate inclusion. You can begin with a grid of finite dimensional algebras and then ask the question, where does it come from a subfactor? And the answer to that question was given by Popa in an important theorem. Popa characterize the grids that come from finite dimensional algebras. Characterize the standard in the what, what I mean by this is the following. We gave a list of axioms for uh, a grid of finite dimensional algebras to satisfy in order that it comes from a subfactor. He called this a standard lattice. So you, this is just a lattice. A standard lattice satisfies some additional conditions and if you have a standard lattice, then it does indeed come from a subfactor. This Popa's theorem is the main focus. So <coughs> many years later, what Jones did was, so, so, so let, this is the end of the second part. So now we get into some things called planar algebras. So before I can define planar algebras, what I should mention is planar algebras are some kind of additional extra structure on this grid. Popa also gave some extra structure on this grid, but Popa's conditions were in the form of equations and this must come here to that. And 
so and so must happen. All, all written out in terms of equations, really hard to understand. And the proof is a tough proof. His paper appeared in the invention at that time. Now, Jones observed the following. So, Jones observed that the standard invariant of a subfactor has a different formulation as planar algebras. So, what is a planar algebra? So, usually when we study um, objects, there is there's a collection or one vector space or a few vector spaces and a few maps and axioms governing these maps. So, if you want to study an algebraic system, it is typically characterized by some vector spaces of some kind, say, or modules of some kind. And a few maps are there, and these maps are subject to certain axioms. So if you want to have, if you want to say what is a Hopf algebra, it's it has a mu, it has a delta, it has an epsilon, all these things, and these are connected by some axioms. Planar algebras, on the other hand, have an infinite number of vector spaces and an infinite number of structure maps connected together with an infinite number of axioms. But these are connected in a very beautiful way related to the structure of the plane and plane topology. So let me let me define what a planar algebra is. So this is a, it is a collection of vector spaces. So these are usually indexed by so it's a collection of vector spaces T K plus minus. So there's so if I write it out. There's a P0 plus, there's a P1 plus, P2 plus, so on. And also there's a P0 minus, P1 minus, P2 minus. Collection of vector spaces together with and I quote this, an action by the author of Planar angles. And I'll spend some time explaining what exactly this means. So I have to tell you what is a planar angle. I'll give you an example and point out what its main features are. So here is an example of a planar map. So it contains first one external circle, then it contains some <coughs> internal circles, then it contains some strings or lines. So these circles are joined by certain kinds of strings. So I draw that in a different color. Notice that these strings start from one point on these circles and go to another point. This, you, you should think of this, you should think of this planar triangle as you think of this as a cardboard from which these holes have been punched out. So any action that is going to go on, nothing is going to happen inside those inside those circles, right? Nothing is going to happen inside these internal circles. Everything is between the external one and these internal ones. Everything that's going to happen is going to happen there. And what is going to happen? There are some strings. There are, in this case, I only drawn one kind of string. There are two kinds of strings. There are strings which begin and end at these points, and there are also sometimes free floating strings. So there will be some free floating strings and some strings which begin and end at various points. Every circle must have an even number of strings impinging on it. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's four. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, and here is one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. So all these circles must have an even number of strings in paging on. All this is data, there's still more data. Then there must be a shading. So these the regions must be shaded alternately black and white. So for example, if I shade this region to black, 
then this region will be shaded white, this region is shaded white, so this must be shaded black, then this is white, so this is black, this is white, so this is black. Across the string, the shading has to change. So this is white. There's a shading. And finally, the last piece of data that is there is so-called star arcs. So each one of these circles, one of the arcs on the boundary is designated as a star arc. For example, for this big circle, I could call this arc, this arc here, the star arc. For this one, maybe I'll call this the star arc. So for this one, maybe I'll call this one the star arc. For this one, I'll call this one the star arc. There are these. So much is the data for a plane arc. Why is it called a triangle? Oh, tangle. Tangle, tangle, sorry. Tangle, it's, it's, it's a planar tangle. Right? Okay. Now, so what, what, what do you do? What, what, what does action by planar tangles mean? So first of all, what can you do with planar tangles? What is the operator of planar tangles? Now, what you can do with planar tangles is the following. If you have a planar tangle, and you have another planar tangle, such that the outs inside of one matches with the outside of the second one, you could substitute it into the other. So let me illustrate with one simple example. So here is, look at this one. So let me take this angle. A very simple planar angle is this one. And let's say it is shaded like so. And let's say it's starting. Now this planar tangle, the second example of a planar tangle is a very simple one. It doesn't have any inside circles at all. That's allowed. You need not have any inside circles. It's perfectly all right to have no inside circles, only strings. There's only an outside circle and strings and star for every circle. Now what you can do is you can take this and put this in here. So if you put this in here, what happens then this line goes this way, this line goes this way and the shading continues and you erase whatever boundary was there previously, right? Then you get a new tangle, right? Planar tangle, so there is the form and off right and the substitution. Now, Honestly, I don't know what an operator is, but it's not needed. So all, all we need to know is that you can substitute one inside another. That's all I want to know. And that the substitution operation is associated. Essentially, these are the things that define an operator. That is, if you first substitute one into the other and substitute the result into the third, that is the same as substituting another order. There is an obvious sense in which substitution is associated. Okay. So you have planar tangles and then you have these vector spaces. So what, what do planar tangles have to do with vector spaces? When does it form a planar algebra? So when it forms a planar algebra is as follows. Now given a planar tangle like this, so let me take this out again. So I have left my original tangle. So given a planar tangle like this, each of its circles has a k plus minus associated to this. For example, what is the k plus minus for this circle? So this has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points. It's always an even number of points, so I divide by 2. So the k for this is 3. And is it a plus or is it a minus? If the star arc occurs in a black region, then it's a minus. If the star arc occurs in a white region, it's a plus. So here the star arc for this is in a black region. So this is 3 minus. What about this one? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is 3. But now the star arc is in a white region, so it's a plus. What about this? There are 4 points, so it's a 2. And the star is in a black region, so it's minus. And then there's the outside one also. 
The outside one, as we said, had 10 points on the outside, so it is a 5. And is it a plus or a minus? The star is occurring in a white region, so it's a plus. So if you have any planar triangle in the, in, the, in the sense of this definition, each of its disks comes with a k plus minus. And what are the axioms of a planar algebra? What does it mean to have an action by the operand of planar triangles? What this means is this triangle must give a map. So if, if I call this triangle T, the map is usually denoted by Z sub T. So where does this give a map from? So from the tensor product of T of all the insides to T of the outside. So from, in this case, T3 minus tensor 3 plus tensor 3 2 minus T3 5 plus. This is part of the data of the planar algebra. If you want to specify a planar algebra, you have to give me vector spaces, so many vector spaces, and you must tell me for every triangle one map like this. All of this is part of the data of the planar algebra. And what are the axioms? The axioms are that it should be, well, there are three axioms, but the most important one is it should be compatible with substitution. That's the main axiom. I will just check what this means. So, is there an ordering for this tensor product? Yeah, there. So, it, there are two ways of doing it. One way is to think of it as ordered, in which case one you would call this disk one, this one disk two, and this one disk three. Another way is to do it without ordering. If you do it, if you do it with ordering, there will be one extra axiom. If you do it without ordering, that extra axiom won't be there. It depends, it's just a choice. What you should think of, what you should think of is I can put inputs from the appropriate vector spaces into this. The planar triangle is a machine whose inputs are appropriate elements of the vector spaces P3 minus, P3 plus, and P2 minus, and whose output is an element of P5 plus. So every planar triangle is a machine which gives you an output, and the axiom is this should be compatible with substitution. This axiom I will explain in one example. This is an important example for planar algebras in any case. What is the bearing of the inner strings which are, don't touch the edges? Because they don't have any... Yeah, they, <coughs> they don't. Initially they don't have, but in all the nice planar algebras, okay. so the planar algebras that we will consider which come from subfactors, they are particularly nice kinds of planar algebras, and in those things, each of these things will contribute a multiplicative factor of the square root of the index. So there's this index for subfactors. It doesn't matter. It contributes a multiplicative. You can remove this at the cost of putting in a multiplicative factor in the nice planar algebras. But there are other planar algebras which do not come from subfactors, which are also interesting in their own right, where these things do have some error to play. It depends. The, 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 the ZT will depend on how many there are and where they are placed and things. Okay. So let me explain the compatibility with substitution axiom in one case. So here is a triangle called M. This triangle called M has two internal disks, one external disk, and strings as follows. It's a very simple one. And then I have star arcs and shape. This thing is often called the multiplication tag. Okay. So here is the multiplication tag. What, what is it supposed to do? If you have a planar algebra P, this multiplication triangle is supposed to give you a map. So if you see what is the color of this, what is the K and plus minus for this? It's of color. That is 2, that thing is often called the color, so I keep saying color. It's 2 and it's a plus because the star is in the white region. This also is a 2 plus and the outside is also a 2 plus. 
So this tangle M is supposed to give you a map from P2 plus tensor P2 plus into P2 plus. So if you think of P2 plus as it's a vector space, it's a map from A tensor A to A. So that's like multiplication, that's like a multiplication map. When would this be a multiplication if you expect it to be a usual associative multiplication? You want, you want this multiplication to be associated. And I want to say that if you have a planar algebra, this multiplication is associative. This is how you get algebraic information from these pictures. And that's the main point of planar algebras. It is to compress a lot of complicated algebraic information into fairly simple pictures. Manipulation with pictures will allow you to prove all kinds of really difficult things to prove otherwise. Okay. So, so the claim is multiplication is associated. <coughs> so let's think of this as let me think of this as the first disk and this. So if I put in x here and y here, I'll call whatever output comes out as x, y. Right? So I put x in the top disk, y in the bottom disk, and whatever comes out, I will call that as x, y. I want to show that x times y, z is the same as x, y times z. So I want to show So this is an algebraic thing that we want to prove. And I claim that this algebraic thing can be proved by just looking at some pictures and seeing how they behave. What picture should I look at? So let me take y and z. What is the product of y and z? The product of y and z is, you put y here, z here. And multiplication that. That is what is y, z by definition. Now what is x times y, z? What you must do is you must multiply x, so you must take a big one. You must take x and multiply it with yz. That means in your second in your second disk of the multiplication tangle, you should put in this. You put x here and put in y here and put in z there. And of course you have to erase this part. That is what is x times yz. On the other hand, what is xy times z? So the trace angle is the following symmetry angle. 
So let me show it for 3. So here is the dress time. So let me also shave it. So let me clear the one. one. So let's see what its input is and what is its output. Right? The input, this has six points, so it's a three. And shading this is in a white region, so this is a three plus. What about the output? The output has no points, there are no points on the external boundary, so it's a 0. And, oh, I should have put the star. So there's only one place to put the star, there's only one boundary component. It's a plus. So if I call this Z trace, it gives you a map from P3 plus to P0. Now it's a very nice exercise to convince yourself that this map is a trace. Oh, the multiplication defined by that. What does it mean and why? Okay, I, I should have said, I, I neglected to say one important thing about tangles but which should have been clear. So, tangles, the action of tangles is only defined up to isotopy. If two tangles are the same up to isotopy, then they give you the same answer. So, let me show you that. So, tangles are defined up to isotopy. So, for example, if I take this tangle, suppose this is the 1 and 2, or if I take the same one to the 1 and 2 interchange, <coughs> these two tangles of course, I have to put stars for everything. These two tangles are equal, exactly equal. The reason they are equal is I could change one by an isotopy. I could move this D1 slowly across and move this D1 across and put it on top and I'll get this. And it's just a smooth isotopy of the plane, right? I can, I can by, by diffeomorphism, strictly speaking, by diffeomorphism of R2 to itself, orientation preserving diffeomorphism of R2 to itself, I could change this picture into this picture. And what is that diffeomorphism? It's basically moving this across and getting it over there. That can be done. And so these two tangles must give you the same answer. And this is the essential verification to show that this thing is a trace. This map is a trace, follows from those, the two pictures being isotopic. In this way, all kinds of algebraic properties you can see just by Manipulating pictures. That is the whole point of planar Okay. So, sorry, you this map to the trace for the multi defined. For the multiplication, sorry. Oh, for, the, for the multiplication, which I defined earlier. Okay. Using the. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. 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 So, what do I mean exactly? That means. Uh, that means, uh, to say that it's a trace, that, that means it says that if I take tau of xy is equal to tau of yx. If I call this tau, if I take x and y, if I multiply x and y and apply this map, or if I multiply y and x and apply this map, I get the same answer, the answer being in P0. And the verification is essentially that these two pictures are the same after after I Oh, and I have a question. So yeah. just for clarification. So we are taking all possible tangles and yes. defining action of that on that surface. Sort of yeah. yeah, I see. Because that is part of the data of a planar algebra. So, so as you can see, all possible tangles. Huh? Action of all possible tangles. All possible tangles. tangles. All possible tangles. So as you can see, just the definition of a planar algebra is really forbidding. How on earth will you take will you take an infinite, a doubly infinite sequence of vector spaces and specify the action of all possible tangles 
so as to get something reasonable, so to satisfy the axioms. And that is where Jones' theorem comes in. So Jones broke this very remarkable design. Why did you go to the plane? You are only allowed planar isotopy. You are not allowed, for example, to flip this around. Oh, okay. Only planar isotopy. Yes. You are still in P2. But then you have a map from P3. Yeah, no. The, the multiplication tangle I drew was for P2, but there is a similar one for P3 with 3 of them. The trace example I took for 3, but the multiplication I showed only for 2. There is a similar one for 3 also. It's that multiplication Did I... Uh, so I should have done this also with 3. With one more. In the middle also, yes. Thank you. Okay. So, Jones came up with this wonderful theorem relating planar algebras to subfactors. And what he showed was the following. So he showed that if n and m is a finite index subfactor, such that. So, to say that there is a planar algebra associated to a subfactor, I have to tell you how to begin with that subfactor and how to get that set of vector spaces and how to get that set of maps, all these standard maps. So, is it for any subfactor or 2 one sir? 2 one. For me, always 2 one. Finite index 2 one subfactor. Only 2 one factors for my talk. So, for any finite index 2 one subfactor, n and m, there is a planar algebra associated such that what is pk plus? It's a relative commutator. It's n commutator intersect uh, mk minus 1. And pk minus is m commutator intersect mk. This links it up back with Popa's standard invariant. So the standard invariant of a subfactor consisted exactly of two sequences, increasing sequences of algebras, which were the n commutant intersect m case and m commutant intersect m case. And so Jones, what Jones observed was that the standard invariant of Popa admits an action by planar tangles. And the proof of this thing is it's a very long paper. Proof of this is, is quite 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 a tedious proof. Tedious proof in involving lots of planar calculations and seeing what they mean in terms of associated maps. But once you have this theorem, so if you, if you take this theorem for granted, there is a lot that you can do. So, in two ways. So, a lot you can do in both ways. That is, you can go from subfactors to planar algebras, thereby giving you lots of examples of planar algebras. On the other hand, you could take non-planar algebras and given a planar algebra, there are many constructions which give you other planar algebras. You can take planar algebra as an abstract object. For example, you could take tensor product of planar algebras. Or you could take a planar subalgebra. There are lots of constructions which you can do with planar algebras. And then go backwards to find out what is the what subfactors you get. So this way it's a, it's a very fruitful interplay between both sides, between this algebraic uh, this uh, topological picture and the analytic picture of subfactors. Okay. Now I have only five minutes. So let me try let me try to summarize what is it that we have done. So, remember everything was motivated by Popa's theorem. Popa said, if you have a standard invariant, then you can get a planar algebra from it. So, Popa, standard invariant, sorry, you can get a subfactor from it. Now, uh, Jones has reinterpreted the standard invariant in terms of planar algebras. 
So, so the question is, how do you get a subtractor from a plane direction? And what kind of subfactor must you get? You must get a subfactor whose planar algebra is the one that you started with. That's the goal, right? You want to take a planar algebra and then you want to get a subfactor from it such that when you take its planar algebra, you get back your original one. That's what that's what will prove for us here. And this was done initially by Guillaume Jones and Shark Tenko. Construction is now called the GJS construction. It's an important construction. And when they did this GJS construction, what they did was they took a planar algebra and gave one construction and finally produced a subfactor and verified that this was its planar algebra was the original one using lots of things. They used random matrices, they used free probability theory, they used lots of techniques in order to do this. So when Sundar and I looked at this result, we felt that. All of those things should not be needed. It should be a, just a purely plain algebraic -like proof. And indeed, there is. So, after this, we produced a plain algebraic -like proof, a pure plain algebraic -like proof of Popa's theorem. And that's a testament to the power of plain algebra. Popa's theorem is a really difficult theorem. Whereas, if you look at the plain algebraic -like proof, it's really simple, right? It's not completely trivial, of course, hopefully, but it is quite simple, right? And it's, it shows how powerful the techniques of planar algebras are in uh, proving statements about subfactors. Then later, little later, we observed that the subfactors produced by GJS construction depend only on certain graphs. And not on the full planar algebra. So the full planar algebra contains a lot of information. As I said. But finally, we, we saw that you don't need the strength of planar algebra to do it. You can just begin with a finite graph with a weighting on it. The weighting is just uh, a real number associated to every vertex. You can begin with a finite graph and construct a one arm algebra from it. And this one arm algebra will turn out to be a factor, and these factors are the ones that exactly arise in GJS construction. At the, at the point we proved this, we also could show the following, which connects up with free probability theory again. So recall that if you have a group, then you have a one lumen algebra, Lg, and if G is ICC, then you have a factor Lg. So you have LF2 and LF3. Which one does it know are isomorphic or not? But um, Radulescu and Dikema found out that you, do, you can have interpolated free group factors. You can also have an LF2.5 or an LF5 or whatever. You can have a free group, inter so called interpolated free group factor for any real number greater than 1. So you have LFR for R greater than 1, yes, yes. So this is the result of uh, Dikema and Radulescu independently. So what we, what we proved was that the factors that you get in this case, so the factors arising from finite graphs are indeed LFRs for some, for some finite graph. There is also an LF infinite. And this involved a very pleasant detour into um, free probability theory. I thought I would say something about that, but I'm already out of time, so I'll stop at this point.